holy and holy. Let's all stand. Number two in the book. Holy, holy, holy. Let's lift it up on that first verse. Ridge Baptist Church this morning. We're so glad that you've joined with us this, today. We are excited about being in God's house uh, and excited about the songs that we've already sung. Thank you, choir, for singing and Brother Dan for leading in those songs this morning. You can be seated and we'll pray here in just a moment and we'll pray for uh, our pastor. Pray he's out of town today. It's as uh, most of you well know, but he is over with uh, Miss Amy and, his, and the girls over in England. And so we'll pray the Lord would uh, bless them. Brother Dan told us in the early service, he may be playing it on telling you later, but uh, he uh, I uh, got a phone call from Pastor uh, sometime early this morning, and uh, but uh, it wasn't early for Pastor. They're a little bit ahead of us, and so they'd already been to church. Pastor preached this morning uh, over there, and it was with uh, Brother Levi and Miss Brittany and uh, their family, and so praise the Lord for that, and praise the Lord that they're over there having a good time, getting to encourage our missionaries, getting to uh, share the love that we have for them, and, uh, and get to know the ministry a little bit better as they'll spend some time over there over the next few days, and then they travel back on Friday, get back in late on Friday, early on Saturday, so pray the Lord would continue to bless them and their trip and the missionaries that they'll go uh, and, uh, and see. So let's go to Lord in a word of prayer and ask Him to bless the service this morning. Father, thank You so much for the truths that we've already been reminded about, maybe in Sunday school, but certainly already in this service. Lord, You are a holy God. Uh, the angels and all those in heaven worship You uh, nonstop. And let, Lord, today, uh, in the busyness of life, we, uh, we oftentimes forget, but today, Lord, help us to reserve these next uh, 50 minutes or so to worship You in our hearts, Lord, with the songs that we sing, <clears throat> the way that we respond to the preaching, the thoughts that we share and uh, communicate with one another, the giving that will happen as we leave. Lord, I just pray that everything today would be just a taste of heaven as we worship you together. And if someone's come this morning that doesn't know you personally, I pray they'd walk out of these doors changed because they've put their faith in you as their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray for Pastor and his family. They'd have a wonderful trip over in England. Lord, keep them safe. Help them to enjoy it. The missionaries as well. We thank you so much for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I just want to go over a couple of announcements for you this morning so you can take advantage of some things that are coming up in our church, uh, and then Brother Bobby will come and share an announcement with you when I'm done. But uh, we are looking forward this evening. If you are an usher uh, or you'd like to be an usher at the church, we are going to have a meeting after the evening service, and so you can come right up here near the front after the service tonight, and you'll get some training on that, and we'd be glad to have you uh, in that meeting. And then on October the 7th, there's going to be a CPR class. We do these uh, periodically, and so if you've been interested in uh, 
uh, in learning CPR, you can sign up uh, out in the lobby and get some information on that. And, uh, and there's uh, some things you could uh, benefit from that and a lot of different applications for that, uh, obviously. And you just never know when you'll need it. And so we try to uh, make that available, especially if you work in a children's class uh, in any way. Obviously, they'll cover some things that might be beneficial for you in case of an emergency there. And then, uh, ladies, there is a ladies retreat on November 10th and 11th. And if you have any questions, you can uh, see uh, one of the ladies. We can get some information for you for that. And there might be some information out on the table in the lobby for you as well. And I want to thank everybody who took part in our garage sale for our teenagers this week. We, uh, you, many of you donated things. Many of you came and uh, bought something else that somebody donated after you gave your own stuff. And we want to thank you for all of that. And, uh, and also just give you an update. I don't have the, the final number, uh, but I know we made somewhere around uh, $7,500 at the sale for our teenagers. And so we are rejoicing in that. And many teenagers will benefit uh, with trips and things that they have coming up. And want to thank you for uh, help that you gave or things that you gave or prayers as we gave tracks to everybody that would take them as they left. And it was just a wonderful time. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that as well. If you are a guest with us in church today, this is your first time that you've ever been here, maybe first time in a long time, there's a connect card in the pew in front of you. If you wouldn't mind to take that card, and it filled out just as much information as you're comfortable uh, sharing. We just want to send you a letter to thank you for being here. Uh, I won't bother you, pester you as time goes on. I want to thank you for being here. But you can drop that off as uh, our guest services counter out to the left in the lobby. And I want to give you a gift to thank you for being our guest here in church with us this morning. Brother Bobby, you can come. He's going to share a couple things with us. Uh, and then we'll move on with some more singing today. Thank you, Daniel. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. He, each year at this time, we have an annual harvest party. So if you've not been able to be part of that in the past and you have children, I encourage you to come to that. It is geared for, for ages from the youngest all the way up to about 12 years old. We will have games, we'll have inflatables, and the kids have an absolutely wonderful time. Each child leaves with the plan of salvation in a bag that they, that they receive, along with some information about the church and our programs for kids. Um, hundreds and hundreds of kids show up on our grounds that day, and it is three hours, uh, and it is on October 21st. And so I tell you that for two reasons. Number one, if you have kids, grandkids, whatever, we want them there. We'd love to have them there. Number two, I need a lot of volunteers and a lot of candy. Um, it, takes, it takes a lot of folks because we'll have, uh, we'll have several games. And so if you volunteer that day, chances are you'll be spending the, uh, the day working a little game. They're very simple games, but you're interacting with those kids, giving them some candy and encouraging these folks in our community. Um, so, number one, I need volunteers. As you leave today, there will be a sign up out here and we will communicate with you what we need there. And it, like I said, it's three hours, but it's a, it's a lot of fun. Number two, we do need some candy. Now I gotta be careful here. In the first service, I said, Skittles and Starbucks are great. Starburst. <laughs> I'm not sure kids are ready for that coffee yet. Um, but stay away from peanuts, but if you can bring some bags of candy, drop those off in the lobby. There'll be a, there'll be a box back there starting tonight, uh, but if you can drop that off in the lobby, that would be great, and we just take that, we distribute that through the games uh, as the kids play. So October 21st, 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock, volunteers and candy. Second announcement. <clears throat> October is Pastor Appreciation Month. So if you have a moment, we appreciate our pastor. He does a lot. He shepherds faithfully. He preaches faithfully. Um, spends an untold amount of time uh, shepherding this church. So I encourage you for the month of October, take time to write a note, put a gift card, do something, let pastor know you appreciate him. And then do one other thing. If you, when you send him that note, not everybody has a month appreciating them. So if there is somebody in your life, in this church, that does something for you, does something above and beyond, you say they mean a lot, take a minute to send them a note. That thank you means a lot. I could point to these guys back here. These guys are faithful. Uh, Dan and Daniel and Kyle, they're faithful in what they do here. So if you have a moment to encourage them as well, I would, I would ask you to do that. There will be a basket out front to drop those cards in. So I think that's all I have. Thank you, Brother Bobby. 
Let's all stand. 637, 637, only a sinner. Not have I gotten, but what I see. Isaiah 53 says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Shall we sing? Glorious King, all His wrath. 
Jesus arose. So we can thank the Lord for that. And he said, well, that sounds like an Easter song. Well, this is an Easter day. Every Sunday is Easter. If we remember, we say, we say that around Easter, and we all kind of say amen. But then when somebody sings a song like that in September, we cut, start to thinking. But then we're reminded that Jesus Christ arose, and we can be thankful for that fact. And we're so glad that you're here this morning. And I'm thankful that Pastor gave me the opportunity to uh, preach his word this morning. If you want to take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter number 15, I'll share a story with you when you, uh, as you're turning there in honor of our pastor, uh, always sharing a joke with us. And so uh, as a I was, uh, heard the story of this lady. She lived, has just moved to this bigger city. She moved from the south up north, and so she wasn't quite acclimated to the way people uh, talked up there, and, so, and, and none of us really are, and I'm from up there. And so they, she got there. She was in a big city, and, and she's having to take uh, a bus, public transportation, to get somewhere. And so she had a young, a young child, and she was about to get on the bus, and she waited and got on. And, and she got on the bus, and the bus driver looked at her, and she said to the lady, she said, lady, that has got to be the ugliest baby I've ever seen in my entire life. And she's just like, whoa. I, you know, she was obviously taken aback and then, you know, it takes her a second. Then she walks all the way to the back of the bus. It's the only seat was in the back. And, and she's just, by the time she gets back there, she's just fuming, as you could imagine. And she's as mad as anybody could ever be. And she's just kind of grumbling to herself. I can't believe he said that. And, and it's just, she's kind of doing that. And, she, and the guy sitting down next to her, he looks at her and says, what's wrong? She says, you'll never believe it. I, got, I just moved up here and nothing's really going the way I thought it was going to go. And then I had to take this bus this morning. I got on the bus and lo and behold, I got on the bus and that bus driver, he insulted me. And you couldn't, you'd never believe what he said. I just can't believe it. And he stopped her. He said, lady, you know what? No one should take something like that. If he if he insulted you, you know what you should do? You should go back up there. And I want you, go, you go back up there and you tell him off. You tell him what you really think. And while you go, I'll hold your monkey. <laughs> See, you just never know. So sometimes people are trying to help you and they're not doing any better than the first. So there you go. And that joke may have been the worst one you've heard all week, but it is the beginning of the week. So, all right. Romans chapter number 15, I am thankful, like I said, Pastor gave me the opportunity to preach, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing how it all goes for them over there. And uh, it's pretty funny this morning, uh, you know, Dan and I, we, uh, Dan preached at 845, and Pastor asked me to preach at 11, and we didn't talk much, uh, we didn't talk at all about the service, I don't think, just uh, he planned his part, and I planned my part, and we kind of, uh, we were pretty busy with the garage sale over the last few days, and, and, uh, and all that we uh, had going on, and so... Uh, we, we got up, and Dan gets up this morning at 8.45, and he had everybody turn to the book of Ruth. And uh, you'll find out here in just a minute, I'm going to end up in the book of Ruth too. And, uh, and he preached this whole message. And, uh, and thankfully, uh, we had a different, different, uh, different direction, but it didn't matter which service you came to today you're going to hear a message about Ruth. And you could have come at 8.45, you could have come at 11, and I'd say that we serve a sovereign God, don't we? And he knows exactly what we're going to get into and had us both preaching from the same, uh, some of the same thoughts this morning, uh, just a different, different deliverer, all right? And so, uh, but I want to talk to you this morning about a thought that's been on my heart and uh, we'll find the phrase in chapter number 15 of Romans chapter 13 is why I wanted to go to because we're going to end up in Ruth in the second point, but we're going to start here. I want to read this verse together with you this morning. It says, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. Let's read that out loud together. Verse number 13, ready, begin. Now the God of hope fill you with uh, all with joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. In every dark cloud of difficulty, there is a silver lining of hope. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless the message this morning. Father, thank you so much for the time we've had in church already today. Lord, we thank you for our church and the Lord that we get to come here, that we get to worship together, that you, we get to see you at work all the time. If we just pause to uh, look at it and, and look at life, Lord, that way. And I pray you'd help us this morning. There's somebody that came in here, maybe many that came in here this morning, uh, Lord, lost without hope not knowing where they'll end up when their life on this earth is over and having a big question mark uh, deep down inside that maybe they don't share very often. I pray you'd help them to find hope in you today. Lord, many have come to this room that, uh, that have you in their life. They're your child, and yet still hope is something that they seem to grasp for. And Lord, I pray that we would all walk out of here more fully aware of the truth that you are the God 
of hope. And I pray you'd bless the message in Jesus' name. Amen. What does the world need today but that idea of hope? We could list out some of the greatest struggles that people face, if you think about it, uh, prevalent in our day, even fear, anxiety, depression, crises in people's lives, worry, opposition from some external force, intense need, overwhelming obstacles. There's one common thing that everybody in those situations would need, hope. I remember reading the story, I guess I've read it a couple times, of uh, Louis Zamperini. Louis Zamperini is from California, and he was a uh, pretty troubled child, really, when he was young until he uh, got into uh, running. And, uh, and so he uh, was a set, or really setting himself to uh, go to try to beat, I think, the four-minute mile. And, uh, and he was uh, just training and training and training for it. He was gonna, had already been to the Olympics once and was going to go uh, most likely again, but uh, World War II broke out. And, uh, and Louis Zamperini ended up uh, in the military, and he uh, was, uh, and there, I'll tell you just a few of the details so you can kind of catch up to speed. He was uh, a, a bomber in an airplane, and they were flying all kinds of missions. And if you know anything about the, the history of World War II, there was a, uh, a lot of uh, uh, failures of machinery with all the airplanes and all the kinds of different things that went on. And, and they were in a different plane than they normally were in one day, and, and, uh, and that plane that he was in went down over the ocean, and, uh, and he uh, and just one other person, uh, I think, survived the, the crash, and they ended up on one of the life-preserving rafts, and they floated for uh, weeks at a time, and eventually ended up uh, a prisoner of war over in Japan. And uh, Louis Zamperini was a, uh, he was a tough kid. He was a hard, uh, hard to get along with probably at times, but he had a, a, a spirit within him that was just never going to give up. And yet, yeah, while he was a prisoner of war over in Japan, they, they pushed him, they pro- prodded him, they, they tried him, they did all that they could. There was uh, quite a few atrocities, obviously, that were committed just against this one man, that they, the, the, the uh, different places that he went. It seemed like the leader of that place always seemed to make it their explicit goal to break the will and spirit of this one individual. And he went through things that if we relayed some of them this morning, they would uh, truly uh, be revolting even just to consider some of the things that they put him through. And there were times where he just wanted it all to be done. And yet somehow, he was able to get all the way through. You know, the thing really that if you, you can go on, you can find videos of him now, he's uh, passed away now, but, uh, but the thing that really carried him through in those times was just always that spark of hope that it wasn't, that he wasn't going to be broken. Now, all of this was happening in the life of an unsaved man, and he made it through, but when he got back to the States… His life just about fell apart. The oppression of the prisoner of war camps was unsuccessful in breaking him. But returning home almost ended him. Until one day, after a long season of pestering by his wife, one day, the, his wife and some others had been going to church, and they ended up at a Billy Graham crusade. And Louis Zamperini accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior, and everything about him changed. But I tell you all of that this morning to remind you that you can go through some of the worst things that have ever been gone through. You could be bearing something today that you think that it's about as much as you can handle. If one more thing happens, it's just going to crumble you. I want to hear this morning. I want to remind you there is hope. 
There was hope even for a man that was in the midst of a prisoner of war camp who did not know Jesus and did not know the things we're going to talk about over the next 15 or so minutes, but he made it through. And I believe, by and large, God carried him through that even though he didn't see it. Because you've ever been in those times in your life that you weren't really looking for God to help you, but after the fact, you realized that he was. And I think that was what it was like for Louis Zamperini. He saw after the fact how God had sustained him through things that no human being really could uh, truly endure and eventually brought him to that point where he would accept and know Jesus Christ as his Savior. But this morning, maybe that's where you're at, or maybe you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you're bearing those things. And I want you to walk out of here this morning with that phrase from Romans chapter 15 in your mind, the God of hope. Because that's who we want to focus on this morning. And so I want to share with you just a few things today. The first is this. The source of all hope is God. The word hope appears in the Bible almost 150 times. One-tenth of those times are in the book of Romans. And, and, uh, and then we get right to, near to the end of the book. And this is where Paul makes this, this statement, this one phrase that really encompasses all the rest of them as you really begin to think about what would come out of that fact, the, the God of hope. They see, God is not just a hopeful God. There's not just hope in God. God is the God of hope. You know, if you were going to uh, need something, you would go to the person who uh, had, uh, had it all under wraps, right? If you, if you had a problem with your vehicle, and it was a certain type of car, uh, you would probably want to go to somebody that had spent their life uh, maybe working on that type of vehicle. If you, uh, you, you've had a, we were working with a, a faucet recently, and it was a Fister faucet. And, uh, and I'm telling you what, uh, it, it, it was not working for us. And, uh, and so we were working on that faucet, and uh, we needed a part. And uh, you know what we did? Finally, we went to, uh, went to Amazon. We went to uh, Home Depot. We looked at Lowe's. I mean, you did it. we looked everywhere. You know what we finally did? Called Fister. You know what Fister told us? You can't get that part anymore. So you know what that faucet's doing? Nothing, right? And so uh, it is, it's a lost cause. But we went, we went to the source, the person who could tell us, hey, yeah, this is the link. That's what they did. They say, here's the link to the place you can get the part. You know what happens when you get to that link? Discontinued, right? And so uh, it's all gone, right? We went to the source. We went to the one who would know. And when we're talking about hope, it's kind of like when we look at uh, the fact that I've heard people say, you know, God is a loving God. That's true. But God is more than loving. God is love. Christianity is more than hopeful because our God is more than a place where there is hope. God is the God of hope. You see, if you have a situation that you need a little bit of hope for today, there is no lack at God. There's no lack in God's house when it comes to a need for the outlook that you need to make it through that trying circumstance that you're facing. There's no, uh, there's no wonder and worry in God's mind whether or not you're going to have the money to make up those bills or you're going to have the, the, the endurance to go through that sickness or you're going to have the mental stability to bear the things that you're going through in your family. There's no wonder. There's no lack. There's no worry. There's no anxiety in God as He is the God of hope. All throughout the Bible, we find things mentioned with regards to this, uh, this truth. As we want to think about it this morning, I want to encourage you. Uh, you, can, you can turn there if you wanted, but Lamentations chapter number 3, verse 18, it says this, and I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Remember, this, this may sound like you right now. Remembering my affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, my soul hath uh, them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. This I call, recall to my mind, all of that, but then something else, therefore have I hope. What, what could you recall to your mind when you're talking about Jeremiah, and he had been through uh, oppression, he had watched his city and his nation uh, crumble and be taken captive, and he had seen all of these things happen. What could you recall to your mind in the midst of the, the desolation of your nation and have hope? In the next verse, he says this, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because His 
compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in Him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for Him, to the soul that seeketh Him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. In another place, Jeremiah said, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. All throughout the Bible we find it that at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of the promise having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who are sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.27, to whom God would have made known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Blessed is the man whose hope the Lord is. All throughout the Bible we find time and time and time again that God is the place to go to for hope. And when you go to God, I just want you to walk out this morning thinking of this fact, there is hope in God. If you walk out thinking anything else, I've probably not done my job this morning. I've probably not done what I, at least I felt like God was trying to help me to convey. I want you to be convinced of the fact that you will never go through anything that God cannot sustain you through. There is hope in Him who is the God of hope. And that's why I wanted to talk to you about the book of Ruth today. See, there's a lot of things you can do to study the Bible, and when I was looking at this, this truth, I, I decided, you know, I wonder what the first place as you read through the Bible, the concept of hope is mentioned. Now, if you know uh, how the Bible was uh, written and compiled, the first book written, we believe, was Job. And Job is a, a place where if you read through it, Job mentions hope uh, many, many, many times. It's one of the other most frequent places it's mentioned in Scripture. But as you read from Genesis on, the first place you read where the word hope is mentioned is in the book of Ruth. And, and it's a story of a, uh, of a helpless, of a, of a hopeless woman you see, Ruth had been uh, th this, uh, or not Ruth, but Naomi. If you remember that she, there, there's four th or three things I want you to think about uh, on this story. Dan preached it, uh, and I don't know if they recorded it. That we don't uh, air the uh, 8:45 service, but it's recorded somewhere. He preached a powerful message on all of the details, and and he thought he had a lot to go over. He's covering Ruth an entire message. I've got one point, and uh, and so we're going to go over it here. I want you to think about the the details. I want to, I'm going to give you this this whole point and. A second, and then I want to talk to you about it for a second because this is kind of the progression that all of us go down when we end up in a hopeless situation, but then also it's the way we climb out. And so here it is there's a downward spiral in every hopeless situation, then there is a depressed state when you get to the bottom, but you'll find there is always a divine superintendence. God is always working all the details out. And if you're in a hopeless situation today, we want to get you to that point, that point so you walk out convinced of that fact. You say, what, what was the downward spiral? Remember Ruth, or Naomi's story. Sorry, I always go to Ruth because it's the name of the book, but it says in verse number one of the book, it says, now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled a dangerous time in, uh, in Israel's history that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the company, uh, sorry, the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And, and it goes on and it says here in the next couple verses that within just a short time, the sons get married the husband dies, and the son die. The sons die. And by like verse 5, we've gone from a land of plenty that had a famine to three widows with no help whatsoever. One of them in a foreign land, the one who should have been the one uh, kind of in charge of the situation. 
She fled a famine and found nothing but want. And she gets into that, that place. She's got nothing left. And, and then in verse number, uh, verse number six, it says, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. And this downward spiral that we covered real quick, you see a lady and her husband who think they have the answer to the situation in their life. And so they pack their bags and they move. You know, how often do we do things where we think we know what needs to happen and we, we're, we, can, we can handle this, we can take care of this, and they packed everything up and they had their solution and they moved to a foreign land and they get there and, and her husband gets sick and dies. Her sons, after they get married, they get sick and they die or, so, or, or something to that effect uh, happened. They're all dead and she's now at this place where there's nothing left in the place that she left in the first place. Everything's going good there now. Isn't that so often what it's like? We run from something small into something a whole lot worse. I want to challenge you this morning. If you're facing something difficult, make sure you do what God would want you to do in the scenario because if you try to fix it yourself, you're destined to make it worse. And she was there. She hears about what's going on in Israel. She thinks, I'm going to go back there. But when she gets ready to go, she turns to her daughters-in-law and she says, well, you might as well not come with me because I've done nothing good for you so far. Doesn't that sound like an encouraged person? You don't want to be around me. Everything, that, everything just goes, go, goes sour when it gets around me. I'm a bad luck charm. Just, just go find somebody else to marry. Go get in some other family. You stay here. I'll make the journey back to Israel all by myself. If I make it, I make it. If I don't, who cares? You know, I imagine probably was a little bit of her attitude, and she tries to convince him, and the one, uh, she goes back, but that's when Ruth, she looks at her, and she, she, she's talking to her and all of that, but before Ruth makes her pledge to follow Naomi, we find that first mention of hope in the Bible. And you know what? It's a mention that somebody makes in a hopeless situation. You know, isn't it funny that we only think about hope oftentimes when we don't have it, or we feel like we don't have it? You know, when everything's going good, you don't often think about the things that are helping you have that outlook, approach that difficulty. And she says, verse number 12, Turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope. If I should have a husband also tonight. And she goes on and explain this whole scenario, but I just get what she says. If I should say I have hope. What did she just say? There's no hope. I've got nothing left. I have nothing to offer you. I have nothing I can do. I am of no good to you or anybody else. There is nothing left in me worth being around. There is no hope in this situation. There's nothing that's going to change it. There's nothing that's going to make it any better. Have you ever been there? And that's where she was. She goes back and it doesn't get any better just because Ruth said she was going to come. As a matter of fact, when she gets in, I think it's probably one of the worst. Uh, one of the, you know what hurting people do? They hurt people. Don't they? Hurting people hurt people. If you ever get hurt by somebody, I want you to pause for a minute and just think that person may be going through the worst situation of their life. And before you lash back at them, Try to think, why would somebody have done that? Why would somebody have said that? You say, what do you say that for? Because Naomi just said to her, I'm going to come regardless. And, and if I, I, I'm going to die. Uh, you know, the only thing that's going to separate you, says in verse number 16 and 17, is death. I'm with you to the end. And Naomi travels back, and when she gets back to, uh, to, uh, to Bethlehem, she they, they ask, is this Naomi? In verse number 20, she says unto them, call me not Naomi, which means friendly and kind and pleasant. She says, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. 
Now, I don't call having somebody that's committed to live with you and help you to the end of your life empty. You think about what that must have sounded like to Ruth. It's like, well, who am I? But that's, that's where she was. And when things are that way, most of the time, we would all say the same thing. Man, I've got nothing left. But that wasn't true. You see, depression, a depressed state, whether it's clinical depression or just a season where you're, where you're in a difficult time, gives you a negative outlook even when there's good things around you. And that's where she was. And she just, was, she just had no, no positivity left in her. Mara, I, God has dealt bitterly, bitterly with me. I've got nothing left. Yeah, who's this? Oh, that's Ruth. Who's she? Well, my daughter-in-law. Why is she here? You know, if you start pushing on that, you find out there's some pretty, there's some hope right there. But not to her. And probably not to you either. But, not too long after that, Ruth goes out. And the Bible says in chapter number two, that, verse number three, that she, she just so happens just, just her half was to that's what the way the Bible says. Her half was to light upon a part of the field be, belonging to Boaz. It just so happened that when I was in that scenario, I met the person who had totally changed the rest of my life, the changed the situation. And that's the way that God works. He began to put these pieces together. She ends up at Boaz's field. Boaz sees her. And he says, you know, she, apparently she was uh, uh, very noticeable. Maybe she was attractive or maybe she just dressed for her. And I don't know, but, uh, but Boaz knows her. Who's that? And they find out who it is. And he says, let her, let her glean here every day. She doesn't have to go and just pick the corners of everybody else's field. She can just pick right here. And by the way, guys, while you're picking, drop stuff in the row that she's in so that she can get as much as she possibly can in a day. I mean, it does everything he can, and God begins to put these pieces together, and, and, uh, and Ruth goes back and tells Naomi she gets uh, a, lot, a lot of barley the first day, and she's just blown away at what begins to happen, and, and there begins to be a change in the air, and they, 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 they see something happening in the situation that's facing them. I like what Brother Dan said this morning. It's funny, you know, Ruth goes back and tells Naomi, oh man, this is Boaz, and, and, uh, and Boaz did this, and we're here, and, and it, was, it, it was one day, one day, right? And Ruth, or Naomi starts planning the wedding by the end of the day. I mean, it's just like, that's what, that, that's what moms are like. Oh, you met a guy, right? Okay, when's the wedding going to be? It's like, hold on, mom, right? Yeah, hold on, dad. Yeah, hold on, you know, kid. So, that, but that's what happened, right? And so, uh, they, they started, and they, they, they looked forward through this path, and God, and it won't go through the whole kinsman redeemer, that's what Dan preached about this morning, but all the details that happened from that point to the end of the book where Boaz marries Ruth and raises up children and, and that, the, the children become the line through which David and eventually Jesus comes. But, but I want you to read verse 15 of chapter number four because this is the voice of the lady who had said just maybe weeks or months or however long before uh, she had said, call me Mara because God has dealt bitterly with me. I have nothing left. Left. In verse number 15 of chapter 4, it says, and he shall be unto, or they are, sorry, talking to her, and he shall be a restorer of thy life and a nourisher of thy old age for thy daughter-in-law which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons hath borne them. And, and in this end of this moment, they, they all are talking to her and they, they're all sharing this moment with her that her, her daughter-in-law gets married, she gets, uh, she, she gets pregnant, she has children, and apparently she should have had hope. See, what can take a situation where you've got two widows by the time they get back to Israel with no land, nowhere to go, no home to live in. And from that situation comes the lineage of David, the greatest king that Israel's had to this point, but not the greatest king that Israel will ever have. The God of hope. 
And that verse is such a powerful verse in Romans chapter 15. I want you to notice the, the last couple things I wanted to say to you this morning. There's a few things I want to challenge you with by way of really just a way of wrapping it all up, because this could be, uh, it might be, I'm like, oh, that was kind of a warm, fuzzy thought, but I want to make it a little bit more practical than all of that. You see, the steps that are given to hopeful living are embedded in verse number 13, and it says this, first of all, now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. You know, the first way to have hope, have faith. Exercise faith. You say, well, how do you mean exercise faith? Well, the Bible says that the just shall live by faith. And the exercise of faith is really the, my willful choice to trust in the truthfulness of God. You see, when it does not seem to make sense and I still choose to believe that God is going to work, that's faith. When I remind, I don't have to remind everybody around me all the time, but I have to remind myself, God's got this all under control. God can work this out. There is no situation that is greater than our God. We say the, the, the phrase, you know, when you cannot see His hand, we can trust His heart. We can see the God who is already in my tomorrow will help me to get there. And so we can remind ourselves and that's how we exercise faith. We can exercise faith. We can receive when we do that. The God of peace fill you with all joy and peace in believing. So what do we get when we believe joy and peace? Isn't that what oftentimes we don't have when we don't have hope? Joy and peace. So the way to have that settled disposition when everything is falling apart around you is just believe in God. It's really the only step you have to take. God does all the rest. It's the way it always is. You know, Christian life is so simple. Believe God. Do what He tells you to do in the moment. And He will guide you through. It's the foolish thing to the world. Right? You know, the, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Faith is foolish to the world, but it works in God's economy. And when you do that, I want to give you this final thought, rest, and it kind of goes with the others, rest in His power. What's it say at the end of the, word, the verse? He fills you with all peace and joy in believing that you might abound in hope through your ability to muscle through. Through your intelligence to figure it out through the financial package that you plan for your retirement, through the stability that you've created in life and having a family around you, through a good church that supports you and loves you, through the power of the Holy Ghost. The only thing that can get you through is God. But remember, he is well, well able to do it. Let's pray. Father, thank You for the day You've given to us. Thank You for this truth that we've looked at this morning. Lord, what a privilege and joy it is to be reminded that You're the God of hope. You are the God of hope for Naomi and Ruth. You've been the God of hope for countless others. And we thank You and praise You this morning. And Lord, as we wrap up this service, I, I know that there could be somebody here that is at the end of their rope. Or maybe they have a family member that is. And they just don't even see how this can all work out. I don't know how it will all work out, but Lord, I know You do. And, and as we go to the invitation, Lord, I pray that maybe they just need to come and pray. But maybe somebody came in this room this morning, Lord, that doesn't know You at all. And all this sounds foreign to them, but, but when they hear us talk about, hear me talk about, accepting Jesus. There's something in, in them. And so, Lord, I pray that they would make the decision they need to make today. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to ask you to think about those things. I want, you to, I want to ask you to think about where your hope is. First of all, I just was, I just was praying. I was just thinking. I was just saying these things. If you came to church this morning and you say, Daniel, I don't know if I would go to heaven 
if this was my last day on earth. I don't have a hope for my eternity. Do you know that that can change today? If here in a moment when the piano is playing and all of uh, everybody is standing in a moment, if you'd say, I would like to make a, dis- uh, I'd like to talk to somebody about how that I could have some hope for what comes after this life, I'd encourage you, slip out up this aisle and we'll meet you up front. And we'll have somebody talk to you and share with you what the Bible says about where true hope is in Jesus. If you've got something going on in your life today that just seems to be hopeless, I hope that you've been reminded that in God there is hope, and you'll come and claim that hope, or at your seat, claim that hope. Let's all stand together. The instruments are playing. If you say, Brother Daniel, I, I don't know if I'd go to heaven when I die, but I want to talk to somebody about that. I want to encourage you to step out from where you are. Anybody that's, if there's somebody between you and the edge, they would be glad to get out of your way so that they, you could come and make that decision You can come and find out that there's hope for eternal life. And I'm telling you, if you don't have that hope, none of this other stuff's going to work for you. If you don't have Jesus in your life, there is no hope. You might make it through a difficult time. You might uh, endure for a while. But I'm telling you, there will be something gnawing inside of you, just always reminding you that there's, there's something that's missing and that something is the God of hope himself. Jeremiah said, the Lord is my portion we can find that the Lord gives us that hope because he, can, he wants to come into your life. And I encourage you to step out or catch me afterwards out in the lobby, but maybe you'd say, I've got something going on. Maybe you're watching at home and you, you've got something that's just insurmountable to you. I really can't tell you that that will ever change. It may always be more than you, but it'll never be more than God. And I hope today you remind yourself time and time again there's hope in God because he's the God of hope. And if you know somebody that's going through something right now, maybe they didn't hear this message, maybe they don't even go to church here, maybe it'd be worth taking some of these thoughts if they helped you, if they were a good reminder to you and trying to reach out to them and just send them Romans chapter 15, verse number 13, say, hey, read this. It was encouraging to me today. I think it encouraged you as well. As many times, people going through those times just need somebody to remind them as well. We'll play through just a little bit more and then we'll close the service. that with others. You see, the thing about hope is it's contagious. If you've got it, share it. Get it to someone else. It's the way that God intends for it to work. Father, thank you for this day. I pray you'd bless us as we go here in just a few moments. Help us all to have a little bit more hope in our next trial or the one that we're in right now. And pray, pray, Lord, if there's anybody here that's never accepted you personally, they do it before they leave or do it very soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for uh, uh, just the time that you have given to church today. And uh, I do uh, want to encourage you, if you need anything from, from us, I'll be out in the lobby as you leave and uh, be glad to get you anything that we can or answer any questions and uh, uh, continue to pray for pastor. One thing I did not do in honor of our pastor today is let you out on time. Sorry. He always does and I failed you. So, uh, but we're just a couple minutes over and I appreciate it. Come back tonight. Brother Paul Pritchard's going to be preaching for us. And you say, I don't know who Brother Paul, Paul Pritchard is. Brother Paul, why don't you come up here and pray to close the service, and that way they'll know who they're going to hear tonight. And we're looking forward to it. It's going to be a great service tonight, and we are thankful that you're here today. Brother Paul, pray for us. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your grace to us. Thank you for the message. Thank you, Father, for this day, the day that you've given us to be in the house of the Lord. We just pray, dear Lord, if there is one without Christ in this building, we pray that 
you'd help them, Lord Jesus, to come to one of us, talk to us about the Lord. Father, we don't want anyone to put off another day their salvation. We ask thee to bless them and help them and all that are saved tonight. I pray today, Lord, that you'd bless and help us please, help us preach tonight. Uh, give us your liberty to preach your word. And, and Lord, we just thank you so much for all you're doing. Bless everyone that's here today, I pray, as they go home, as they go to their homes today. In Jesus' name, amen.